So like, this, like the picture states up there, uh, my name is Blake Vince and I come from Merlin, Ontario, Canada. And some of you might not be familiar with where Merlin is, and possibly you've heard of that great uh, Canadian country and western singer, Michelle Wright. Anybody? She sang, what song was she sang? Take It Like a Man. Good for you, sir. <laughs> so this is Canada, the great white north, as some of you kind of refer to our home, my home country, the same country where Jill was born, actually. And uh, where the dot is, is home. And so I'm right across the lake, Lake Erie, from Cleveland, Ohio. And just a little bit to the, I guess, to the west is Detroit, Michigan. And I, uh, as you can see, I'm on this little narrow land bridge here. And if we look at this point in the lake, that's Point Keeley Park. And that's where my wife and I are standing. That's the southernmost tip of Canada. That is the same latitude as Rome and Barcelona, about 42 degrees latitude. And a lot of my presentation is tied directly to water quality and how I feel soil management is very important for water quality of which we all benefit from on this planet. So this is my wife Karen, our daughter Cora and our son Elliot on Father's Day a couple years ago. So today I found with my father Elwin, uh, my uncle Tom, and we grow corn, soybeans and winter wheat and we use cover crops. And to give you an idea, our corn relative maturity would be 102 to 113 day, and soybeans would be a 2.7 to 3.3 relative maturity. So for years we would use red clover frost seeded into winter wheat. And a few years ago, I decided to go down the path of this multi-species cover crop approach. So cover crops in our soil type are very, very important because this over my shoulder is what our soil looks like at home. It's old glacial lake bottom soil. Brookston clay is the soil type. It's classified as a perfectly drained. So tile drainage is paramount. So today, a lot of farmers are down to one raw tiling, 16 and a half feet spacing. So that just screams to me, we have a water infiltration problem. So anybody, I've asked this question before when I was here in Iowa, raise, a, raise, raise your hand if you'd like to call this farm your own. <laughs> Got one tape. I got two tapes, three tapes. How many people would like to give this to their spouse and divorce someone? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually my neighbor's farm, sadly enough, right across the fence road, Cloud, Mobile Cloud. My claim to fame as a 42 year old farmer is that I've never used a Mobile Cloud. And so it's not necessarily due to my good management as much as it is the fact that I was in the right place at the right time, the right environment. And we adapted no till in about 1982 as a 10-year-old boy. And I can remember prior to that riding on the tractor with Dad, you know, and the mobile would trip, we'd hit a stone, and he'd have to back up. And there was a few profanities that would be issued and say, no, don't tell your mother. Okay? But what happens after mobile plowing, every good farmer takes out his angle line and land level because the topography is as flat as this floor that I'm standing on. And any nuance is where all the water goes to. So the soil structure that's there is there is just appalling. So with frost, the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw, that melts out over the winter and then they stale seed bed their corn or their soybeans into that environment. <clears throat> this is a little better. There's a little bit of residue here. This is with a soil saver or disc chisel. Same thing, angle iron land level, land level pass. So in 2006, we went down the road of uh, doing some economics. And where we would struggle was trying to establish corn after winter wheat with all that residue. We could, we could very effectively no-till soybeans into corn stocks, and we could no-till winter wheat into soybean residue. But it was corn that gave us the biggest fit because our soil is clay, it keeps it wet, keeps it cool, delays planting most years. So in 2006, I was doing my cash flow analysis of managing straw, wheat straw, after harvest. And it was costing us at that time $50 an acre. In two, this is 2005, wasn't it? And that was basically for a pass with a straw chopper, angle iron, or a soil saver pass, and then the angle iron land level, and leaving a stale seabed, leaving it vulnerable to wind erosion through the course of the winter months. And I said, something's got to change. So we went down the path, 
of this methodology. So this was produced by a farmer in Minnesota, a soil lawyer, and we did strip till. And it wasn't until a few years later, when I was doing strip till, and I was in, I was in Ohio, where I ran into a man off the side of the site by the name of David Brandt, who I would refer to as the cover crop king. And David Brandt was preaching from his pulpit in the soil pit, and he looked over at me and he said, son, I want to tell you something. I said, what's that, Mr. Brandt? He's got hands like wild lions, great big fat fingers, chill those and very well. I said, what's that, David? I can do way more with roots than you can with that machine right there. And so when a big man like that talks, you better damn well listen. Okay? So David, in his heart, invites me back to his farm, whereby I was there and looked at what was going on. It was pretty cool, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But like I said, frost seeding winter wheat. So in 2009, I left this field of wheat that was, or what left this field of clover rather, that would have been established the year before, frost seeded with a four wheeler ATV, not a lot of capital expenditure. And I convinced my neighbor dairy farmer to take a cut of hay. So that we just took the cut of hay here, you can see the stand looks like very uniform, we let it go to seed. And I bailed off, I took the seed for my own use, and uh, that netted me all in as a very good crop of soybeans. Probably about a 55 bushel crop of soybeans. Net net. But the biggest compliment from that exercise was an old farmer told me one day at the coffee shop, because that's where all the gospel spread for every good farmer, the coffee shop, of course. He said, Blake, whenever I drive by your farm, I slow the car down, I roll down the window, and I just inhale. He said, we used to do that for years because we knew what it did for our soil for many years after the fact. And he says, we quit doing it. And he says, I really can't tell you why we quit. And I thought that was pretty sad. So this is what it would look like when we would leave that clover, if we weren't leaving it to go to a seed crop, in the fall. So in October, because the root mass doubles in red clover in the month of October, I would terminate it with a dicamba product, okay, a corn herbicide with glyphosate, and then I would do my strips. And so you can see our soil is very colloidal when you till it, even with that strip tillage. So the frost, like I said, would break that apart, it settles out, and then we would hit it again in the spring. But it's a monoculture, right? And all of our crops are monocultures, and we're trying to get away from monocultures. And this is an ideal environment, these cover crops, for animals, the benefit of the environment. So here's a nice mallard duck's nest right out in the middle of my field. And that's what it looks like, planting into that strip in the spring. And actually, this was spring-stripped red clover, and there it emerged beautifully. And so, today I'm going away from strip tillage, but for those people that are still sort of, you know, walking slowly towards the next de uh, destination, strip tillage can be a good destination, a good transition, rather, towards the ultimate goal of trying to get right away from tillage altogether. But it's very successful. So that was desiccated in the spring, and then we no-till right into that strip. And I really love this picture because it shows four years of residue. So we just harvested corn, and down here in the little bottom, we still see a corn root ball that has totally remained there four years later. And it's still intact. And the minute we turn the corn root balls over, poof off the environment, CO2, release. So the, the crop rotation would have been corn, followed by soybeans, then no-till in winter wheat, which is this residue, with clover, and then corn. Okay, and So you can see all four crops in that picture. And we're just trying to build up all this soil, all of this residue, all of this armor is the goal, to protect the soil. So this is a real milestone moment. And I came running into the house and screamed and shouted for my wife, and she thought I was having a heart attack. And I said, look what I found, look what I found. She's like, oh, for God's sakes. You're getting excited about this? I said, well, this is a big deal. I said, this is a bird's nest fungi. I said, I've got biological activity out there in my field. And I, you know, it's a real pleasure for me, I should have stated this from the outset, to be following a Joe Clapper, after Joe Clapperton because I saw some of those photos a few years ago in Cincinnati at the National No-Till Conference. 
And for me to be sharing the stage with Jill is very humbling. But Jill really struck that day and resonated with me that we got to get back to thinking about biology, which she touched upon earlier. And this is a good visual indicator because so much of our learning is visual. And uh, so here we see the fungi. There's a corn stalk. And I sent this picture actually off to Jill. I'm not sure if she remembers this or not. And I said, Jill, what type of mushroom is this? Because that's her specialty. So she says, well, I, I'm sort of perplexed. She says, I'm not sure what those white dots are. I said, well, Jill, come on, you're Canadian. That's snow. <laughs> <laughs> so as a frame of reference, you've got the toonie that I handed out today, that little $2 piece, to show you the size of the, the, basically the mushroom cap. And there again, you know, we've got all these fungi, but it's that tangible, thing with our eye, and again, we can see that something is biological that's going on in the soil, because most times you don't see the fungi, but it's the fruiting body is what we can see. So it just validates that something's going on. And look, where's that fungi attached to that heavy cellulose, that corn stalk? You know, it's that fungi that's breaking that down. And if we look at the forest, what do we see? We see the logs that have fallen on the forest floor that are inundated with fungi. And that's nature's cellulosic decomposers at work. They're feeding all of the energy, all of that biomass, all of that cellulose, right back to the living organisms in the forest. So today, in a no-till environment that we're in, we are actually starting to struggle to maintain residue. Our soils are becoming so biologically active that this is the end of the year, we've got all that mat of clover, we've got all that mat of winter wheat residue straw, and where did it go? It's gone. All of the earthworms, all of the fungi, all of the arthropods, all of these things have consumed all of that residue. <clears throat> so I'm trying to maintain residue. So a few years ago, this is 2011 in the fall, I think, I decided that I was going to use strip till and try to emulate what David Branch had shown me on his farm in Ohio with a multi-species cover crop. So there's canola, there's winter wheat, there's soybeans, there's uh, radish, there's some peas. And I blended them all together and I threw it out there. And I'd already planted that first. So most farmers are out there seeing me assuming I'm planting winter wheat. And about a week goes by and I'm out there making my strip till pass. And they think that I've lost my marbles. If they only knew that that was just the tip of the iceberg, okay? The best is yet to come. So it was amazing what people said, well, why in the heck are you doing that? You just, you're ruining your winter wheat crop. So that's a cover crop. And the dialogue that went on from there was quite amazing because as the spring came out, a lot of the species died, but winter wheat still survived. And they said, well, that's a pretty piss poor wheat crop, Mr. Vince, at the coffee shop. And I said, well, that's a cover crop, it's not a wheat crop. And then they would say, well, Mr. Vince, are you ever gonna get your nitrogen on your wheat? But we're pretty yellow. I said, that's a cover crop, that's not a wheat crop. Mr. Bits, that is a far better looking wheat crop than the neighbors got across the road. I said, that is a cover crop, it's not a wheat crop. And why do I love cover crops? Because they have the potential to do great things, one of which is fixed nitrogen that we talked about this morning. And look at those little prills, all those little nodules, right? They're fixing nitrogen, keeping money in my blue jeans. And a lot, all these photos are mine, by the way, with the exception of one that's about to come up. But I love this photo, and I captured that with my iPhone. And here we've got the earthworm, and we've got this root that's all colonized. colonized. And look at the root hairs. I think there's live Viagra in the soil, because they're just standing right up on this. <laughs> so, after... After, uh, you know, the spring, we uh, went in there, and this is where it starts to get interesting, because part of the field was strip till, part of it I left as an experiment, and just broadcast the fertilizer on the top, and I no-till it right in. And so if you look at the picture, you can sort of see where the strip till is, and where the surface applied is, and what, why it's greener is because there was just one extra leaf, okay? But it's not the start of the year that matters. Everybody gets so concerned about how their crop looks out of the gate. And I'm worried about how it looks like finish. 
Okay, so I don't get too worried the crop at the start of the year. Yeah, obviously I want the stand to be all there. But am I too worried that the neighbor's corn is out competing me in May and June? No, not at all. All it is is just coffee shop fodder. So here's July. This is the most critical stage, as every good corn farmer now knows. When the tap shuts off, what happens? It affects pollination. And if we can capture carbon, we can hold on to water. And this crop here, 2013, lacks nothing. It's dark green right to the bottom. It's doing what it's supposed to do. So I owed it to my fellow Canadian, Eric Kaiser, to go and have a visit with him on his farm because he was already utilizing some mixed species cover crops. And when I got there, he also has the benefit of manure. And on our farm, unfortunately, we don't have a luxury of manure. How many of you guys and ladies in the room have livestock rotation? I think a lot of you are in the driver's seat. So in my case, you know, I need to invest money in legumes, which legumes are expensive because I want to fix nitrogen for the subsequent corn crop. If we can use cover crops to grab a hold of the nitrogen that's in the manure, you're in the driver's seat. And as well as you get all the biology from the root or from the digestive tract of monogastrics, you know, that is a real valuable tool. So here on his soil, Eric has poultry litter. He's got all of that biomass out there in between. And there, the soil was just covered with all these fun breaking down that cellulose. And it was beautiful. And if you bring that up to your nose, how many people take the time, in all seriousness, to grab a hold of that soil and pull it up to your nose? How many people? That is awesome. I did that with a farmer in Australia, and I brought the soil up to my nose, and I said, wow, isn't this beautiful? And he never gave the time to smell his own soil. He, he thought I was on crack. <laughs> and I said, take a whiff of this soil, and I just, you know, and he's like, wow, he says, that is powerful. You know, and if I could bottle that stuff up, I could cure drug addiction tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, think about how much money we can make then as farmers, right? <laughs> so there again, if you look at the tip of that pen on that little fragment of corn stalk or a corn leaf, and zoom right in, and here we've got this fungi breaking back down. But when we spray fungicides over the top, like so many of us do, because we're fixed, and I know I'm preaching to the choir folks, unfortunately, but you need to take this message out and be confident to share with other people what you're learning today. So when we spray fungicide or pesticide or herbicide, when is the easiest time to kill something that we've been taught? Louder? Together? When they're small, when they're small, when they're small. Well, how much smaller can we get right there than the tip of the pen? So what we're doing is we're not only we're killing all of these beneficial fungi when we spray fungicides over the top to control or to chase physical bushes. And I don't use fungicides on my farm other than as a necessity, not as a prophylactic. And there again, you know, here's a corn cob. Corn cobs, in my case, most people probably agree, are one of the last things to degrade in a no-till environment. And that corn cob is just inundated with fungi. So the ultimate oxymoron, <laughs> conservation tillage. When you think about that, what's conservation about tillage? You know, it's all tripled up. That's like that famous show from the late 90s, late 80s, early 80s, early 90s, Tim Allen. <laughs> Tim the tool, tool man, yeah. you know, it just makes you, all that adrenaline, all that testosterone as a man, makes you feel alive. And this is what happens when we detach residue corn, and this is Iowa folks, this was 2013 in the spring, a lot of you lived through that room. This is a field of slope, there's a hanging bottom under there somewhere, and that's about four feet of depth. So the only way he gets rid of that, and I'm not sure if somebody in the room happens to own that farm or not, but the only way I figured he got rid of that, is I'd be curious to know how he did get rid of that, or she, is with an excavator, self-propelled torch harvester, or a match. And that's just wasted nutrients. So this is nature's tillage tool. This is taken from this winter at home on our own farm. And look at those pruning bodies. 
detach from that corn cob, break it back down, turn it out into the energy that I can use for my subsequent crop production. And in Canada, yes, we have winter, but there's still biological activity below freezing. And one university, through my research, at minus 40 Celsius, which in American terms is damn cold, <laughs> okay, there is still active soil biology. So when it's not fit for man or beast, we got to think that our soils are alive, they're breathing, they're teeming with life, like Jill talked about. It's just not a medium to support plants' upright growth, right? That's purple light. That's found in the greenhouse. Our soils are alive. And this is the year of the soil, and we need to think more so. And I'm almost embarrassed to show you this picture, because this is our home farm. And so it's a flat topography, right? It lacks, it lacks a lot. And unfortunately, we had just planted corn there, and we got a big gully washer. And how many people have been on the back side of this experience? Put your hand up. What can you do about it besides cry? OK? So what it tells me is that I need to improve. And luckily, now, this farm belongs to me. It was my grandfather's farm, my uncle who farms with my dad and I. I bought it from him. And the first order of business was I decided to tile it. Because on our ground, whether you own it or you don't, whether you pay for it or you don't, rather, you might as well invest in tile. Because otherwise, it really makes really good bricks. So today, obviously, we're using plastic tile. Increased water infiltration, I think we can get away from our dependency on tile. But that's a systems approach, right? It takes time to build up to that level. That just doesn't happen overnight. So the stale seabed approach, every tire track. This is a neighbor's farm. And so I pulled out my Chevy pickup truck, parked the truck, and out the passenger side window, I took this photo. And here's this wonderful flat surface ditch draining all of that nutrients because you can't infiltrate. It's got to run off. It can, this farm can take, that's only about a one inch rain event. And that's how bad it was. One inch. So this is on the driver's side. This is my farm with strip till and a cover crop. And so where we have the most concentrated area of compaction, obviously, the headland, we got a little bit of water. But up and down the field, it's pretty much a stark comparison. So we got a lot better water infiltration. So this is the picture that motivated me for my scholarship. So and this is going on on an annual basis, unfortunately. These are the blue-green algae blooms in Lake Erie. And some of you probably would have heard about Toledo's water being shut off this summer. So Toledo's down over here, I'll save it on the map. And Windsor, Detroit, border up in the north, Cleveland right across the lake. And this is really near and dear to my heart because I'm an ice fisherman. And that little lake on the north there is where I like to go for yellow perch. And the river where my farm water drains into, ultimately the Thames, you can just sort of see at the tip of that void plot that's highlighted is the outlet from the Thames. And you can see an algae, or a plume rather, coming into the St. Clair, Lake St. Clair, which is the little lake to the north, from another river up to the top of Sydney. And so I could hear, I could hear my American colleagues in Ohio in Michigan and Indiana doing something proactive and it was on the radar as it pertained to the health of Lake Erie and that effort those voices were mute in Ontario and like you guys in the room and ladies I'm a farmer I didn't have any letters behind my name I'm just Joe Dirt Farmer that's all I am so I needed to put my you know neck on the line see if I could do something proactively to put some meat to the bone to address this problem that we're having on an annual basis. So where the box is highlighted is where the municipal water inlet is for my family, for my house, for my children. So I think I have a right to be concerned because there's the same blue-green algae. And unfortunately today in southwestern Ontario, there's been a real reversion away from no-till back to full surface tillage. The moldboard plow is alive and well. And that concerns me because we know that we've been very effective. And we've been able to stay profitable with no-till farming and do something that's beneficial not only for myself, but a shared resource that the rest of the world covets in fresh water. So this is the new frontier. This is David Grant's farm. 
And I met David that summer a few years ago. And when I the direction I'm looking at the photo is I'm looking at his 185 bushel corn crop with zero nitrogen fertilizer. And I said, why am I not doing this at my farm? Because I was putting on approximately 170 pounds of actual N and getting the same net result as Mr. Brandt with zero nitrogen fertilizer. And I said, well, who's making the money? A fertilizer company. It wasn't me. And Mr. Brandt was far, far and away out, out stripping me or beating me in yield. Yeah. Yeah, so the one tall plant sun hemp. I'll talk about that in a little bit at the end if that's all right. Do you mind? All right, thanks. But don't be afraid to ask that question again in case I forget. Okay, please? Thank you. So what I decided through my nut field experience was I was going to take what I learned from around the world and I was going to implement that at home on my farm and use my own farm as a bit of a trial. So I used an 11 weight cover crop, sort of duplicating what Mr. Brand had done, three grasses, six legumes, Radish and sunflower, because Jill says sunflower is the thing to plant like. And uh, we plant it directly after wheat harvest, no till, they have a no till drill. And that's what we're saying, for two, three weeks growth. Looks pretty good. People say, we can't do that. So, well, Mr. Brent's making a success of it. Like, you just keep doing what you're doing, don't worry about anybody else. Thank you. So, here's our friends, dear farm. Little dry conditions, they're just conserving their energy. And you can see all those other little tiny holes there, so there's lots of activity with the roots, with earthworms, all different shapes and sizes. Four weeks post planting. You can't really see the picture there on screen because of the sh shading, but the whole field is totally covered and uh, it's looking really, really nice. And this is the ultimate side by side. My name is Rick Sidey, conventionally tilled, a little more plowed, land leveled, like every good farmer does. Still see that the following year. And this experiment came to full fruition last spring as I had a soil water engineer come on my farm. And does everybody know what an engineer uses for contraceptive? Your personality. <laughs> I said that my brother's an engineer and he married his wife who's an engineer. And I said that at their wedding actually. And so I had half the crowd booing and I had the other half the applause. There's a lot of classmates in the audience. But anyways, so Kevin McKenney from Ontario Ministry of um, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, comes out with me and we're walking across. This is in April when I said, have heavy clay soil. So anybody that's clay soil, you know your boots are like canoes, right? Canoes a Canadian boat. <laughs> anyways, so we're walking across, boom, boom, boom. Our boots are clean, they're dry. This is an April day. We're still wearing a winter coat. And on offensive soils, so soils that lend themselves to seed corn production, machine harvest, tomato production, you would have been up to your elbows in the mud if they were conventionally tilled. And we're out there walking in this cover crop field with not a drop of mud on our shoes. So I said, hey, Kevin, why don't you walk across the neighbors? So Kevin says, well, sounds like a good idea. One, two, three, boom. And the shoes are just covered. And the look on his face is priceless. Like he wanted to call me every name in the book. Okay, like what in the, you know. Anyways, so what that showed me was the power of water infiltration. And Gabe Brown in North Dakota, who spoke here, I believe, last year, right, Gabe? His farm can withstand an eight-inch rain event. And they measured that with a double rain infiltration test, right? So two stainless steel rings, one's larger, the other one's smaller, graduated cylinder, stopwatch, and you can calculate how much water the soil will take in. So think about that, if we can increase the water holding capacity, the water infiltration rates of our soils, how much we can reduce erosion. And one of the sessions, one of the questions says, well, what do you do when it floods, right? We can eliminate a lot of those problems. So we're going to head down the path of, uh, is that where I'm at for time left? Or? No, you're, you're That's how much you Half an hour left? No, you've been in for half an hour. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. I was getting nervous. I seen the countdown. Um, so, when we're going to buy cover crop seed, I think it's very, very important that you find a vendor that knows and values what cover crops can bring to your farm. That they're not just selling you another input. Because if they're selling you another input cost, you need to find a different cover crop seed provider. 
So when my cover crop plot that I talked about, I had a level weight cover crop, I had a four weight cover crop that winter killed, I had a two weight oats and radish that winter killed that I to volunteer wheat. And I used the 11 weight cover crop as the check. And I'll share with you a little bit the yield data. But in this picture here, the only difference between these two radishes, the species is the same, is distance, 10 feet. That's the difference. And in the 10 feet, the one on the, the bigger one, has six legumes, and the other one is just oats and radish. So like I said earlier, I do not have manure. Radishes have a voracious appetite for nitrogen. If you have nitrogen, maybe you don't need the legumes. But those are the questions that your seed supplier should be asking you. Are what are your goals? How are you going to establish it? Are you going to use additional fertilizer? Personally, I think additional fertilizer is a waste of money. It's a it's a net negative impact on our environment. So why do I love legumes in my rotation? Because I see that I don't have manure. It's free nitrogen. To look at all those soil, look at all those roots. They're all intertwined. They're lying on top of each other. It is a soil orgy. Okay? Look at that. Think of the biodiversity in there. Think of all the bugs that's going on. So two and a half months of growth. We can see in the picture in the foreground, we have a little frost, this plant's dying, and the pet pollinators are just loving it up there. And I could charge admission to watch butterflies. And it's beautiful. And what this made me aware of is how many non-farming people pay attention to what happens at the farm. Because the questions I received came from non-farmers. And they got it. They said, well, like, once I explained to them what I was doing, they said, I said, well, it's for water conservation and soil stewardship. Well, that's incredible. Why are other farmers doing it? I said, that's a very good question. I don't know. And, they, and I think the big thing is they see this as a threat. They see it as a threat because it's a change. They see it as a threat because there might be that green bridge effect harboring negative insects. Right? It's a challenge to the way we've always done what we've always done. But Einstein said it best, if we do the same thing and we expect a different result, what's that a sign of? Insanity. Thank you very much. So there again, look at all those nodules, look at those earthworms. They're just loving life in there. And here's the next generation of earthworms, a little different species than what Jill showed, I believe. Those are slugs. You think those are slugs? But is it a threat? We'll, we'll soon find out. No, probably not. But the, uh, that's slugs. You think that's sluts, yeah? No, I know it's sluts. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Anyways. But it's, I don't think, feel that as a threat, and I'll share with you some interesting data about slugs here in a second, too. So why do I love cover crops? Because we're capturing valuable winter moisture, we're preventing wind erosion, and we're eliminating snur. And everybody in the room should know what snur is. Brown snow. And in Iowa's case, it's black snow. And as I drove here from Des Moines with my chauffeur, okay, my shuttle driver, I can see all this snurt along the highway. And in the Bible it says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And I have learned that thou shalt not covet thy island farmer's land. Okay? Because unless I physically move, I will never have the opportunity to farm land as beautiful as the soils that are in Iowa. And that's just the way it is. And so you guys are spoiled. Spoiled by comparison. So after the winter, dormancy, we still have some plants that are growing here. And I'm not sure what the energy, green energy initiative is in, in Iowa. Is there any solar, are there any solar panels in the room? Yeah, you can keep hands up. So my question is for those of you that have a solar panel. Does the meter turn in November? Does the meter turn in December? January, February, see a lot of nods, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the soil covered, we're trying to capture photosynthesis and drive that carbon right back to the soil. And Dr. Christine Jones talks about the liquid carbon pathway, and that's all about photosynthesis. That's the biggest asset that we can use on our farms is a science energy, and we just don't even consider that. And unfortunately, this picture is right across the road, that coveted stale seedbed. So when the subsurface soil is frozen, and we get a rapid thaw event, 
accumulate a lot of moisture on the surface, it's got to release. And where does it go? Right up to the ditch. And no buffer strip in the world is going to prevent that from happening. Because Ray Archuleta from the NRCS says it best. All buffer strip is, it's like a leaky diaper. Okay? We all know what happens with leaky diapers. It's a shitty mess. Okay? Out through the lights. We've always been there. I've been there as a parent, you know? Sort of hold them up to the water and sort of wash them off. Anyway, so we, we can assume with great certainty that that's loaded with nitrogen and phosphorus. And even if it isn't, you know, look at the remediation that that person has to do with that soil. Just, it's disgusting, it's appalling. So why do I love cover crops? I like to talk about capturing carbon. We're increasing soil tilt. And this is my farm. I showed you what our soil looks like and what it had potential look like, old glacial lake bottom on that picture of the plow. Fixing nitrogen, evapotranspiration in my heavy clay soil, that's probably my number one benefit for me personally. Because my biggest risk is when all the guys that live close to me on this offensive soil for vegetable seed corn production, they're out there planting. And as a farmer, I'm going to pick on you, sir. I'm going to pick on you. What's your biggest risk? What's the thing you can't tolerate in the spring that drives you crazy more so than anything else? When the neighbor pulls the plane around the shed, you're not ready to go. All right? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Most farmers would say, when the other when the other farmer's ready to go, it must be ready so everybody starts to go. Whether it's ready or it's not. And so in my county, when we live on this heavy clay soil, and there's some really offensive soil in the same county, some alluvial soils, right? They're always able to go before I am. So by using cover crops, I can wick up all that moisture. My soils are fit, they're warm, they're ready to go, and they're biologically active like Jill talked about. So we're feeding the soil with bio biology and big time increase in biodiversity. So this spring, this is home, this is planted corn. It kept raining and raining and raining. And the cover crop was there, growing and growing and growing. And my dad said to me, like every good father in some discussion that happens, what do you think you're going to do, Blake? <laughs> That's looking pretty messy out there. Think you're going to nail that off? I said, well, Dad, if I do that, I'm just exporting nutrients. Yeah, well, that? That's a hell of a mess. <laughs> and we don't have the luxury of having farms, you know, we'll tuck away back to 40 do all these experiments on it, they're right out there in the wide open for everybody to look at, criticize, poke on it, and shoot arrows down my theory, okay? So the question that I just asked was very important because my neighbor was planting corn the same day I was planting this picture because the soils were both bit on the same day, and this is May the 26th. And that day when I walked across the field, okay, in April, when we did get the mud on our shoes, was the day that really I should have been out there planting corn when nobody else in the county could. But I didn't because I had too much pride in the line. I was still wearing my winter coat. The ambient air temperature was too cold. But that's when the soil was fit. And I should have been drawing the planter out of the shed, ignoring everybody else's thoughts, and going to work. So don't you think for a second, I don't want to sit up here and think that I wasn't scared. Because when I sat in the tractor seat, being the Catholic that I am, and I drove straight ahead. Hit go, you know how to huddle that. The Lord was on my side that day because here's the corn. Beautiful mulch. Most people that have a garden in town would give their eye teeth to have a bio mulch like that for from weeds. And there's a few organic producers in the room too. I'm sure they would love that mulch in their system. And look at the corn. Nice, even, uniform, green, consistent. This is all the same hybrid, a pounds of nitrogen fertilizer. That's all I used. Can I save your questions again? I'm almost there, okay? So there again, with cover crops, we're using less nitrogen, zero tillage, zero erosion from wind and water, and the least considered solar. Increased biological activity. We're capturing solar energy 12 months of the year. We're increasing our water infiltration 
We're increasing our water holding capacity so that when that tap shuts off in July, we get hot in Canada too, by the way, folks. You know, where we don't all throw snowballs 24 months, there's phones here. So, you know, it's 95 degrees outside, high humidity, maybe not quite as hot as Iowa. But when the soil stays cooler, like Jill showed with the root growth, right, that ideal soil temperature gel, what was that? 60? 68. 68. Can you imagine having an ideal soil temperature in the middle of July at 68 degrees? But most importantly, with cover crops, we're increasing our financial yield. And there's a big difference between physical yield and financial yield. And so much of today's agriculture, agriculture, as we all know, is driven towards increasing yield. And I sort of walked around up there in the trade show, and there's so many people promising these new miracle products. And what do they all tie it back to? Well, that's going to give you four more bushel soybeans. That's going to give you another 15 bushel corn. You know, on and on and on it goes. I think if we engage our soils and make them more biologically active, we don't have to worry about everybody being in our pocket. We have the capacity as farmers to do this ourselves. So a year-long experiment coming to fruition, and it's been the culmination of a two-year journey with my scholarship. So I said I would share this information about how the corn turned out. So from, we're going to go and pretend that we're not from North America, and we're going to read right to left, okay? So I use the 11-way species, like I said, is the check. On the far right, we have 173 dry bushel corn. The next one beside was oats and radish, 143 bushel corn. Volunteer wheat was 160 bushel corn. The 11-way species, again, was 185 bushel corn. The 4-way species was 164, and then the 11-way species, again, was 185 bushel. Now, I tell people this is one year, one location, one experiment. And I also, like Jill says, I encourage people to start slow. Build confidence. Most importantly, the best thing that I can encourage you to take away from my presentation is, go home, do your own trial on your own farm, with your own equipment, on your own soil, with your own management decisions. Because that's when we really start to get valid data. Don't rely on the data that comes to us from third party. Use your own data and make sure your own judgments. And I think you'll be amazed at how successful you can be. The other thing I want to leave you with, folks, is if you haven't read this book already, it's very, very good reading. Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations by David R. Cameron. And this book walks through every great civilization on the planet and how they're true lack of respect and understanding for soil and how it functions led to their ultimate collapse. And this picture is from the dirty 30s in the middle of the U.S. And I wonder at times how we learned our lesson. And he ties in the U.S. and where we are right now in North America. When I say the U.S., North America in general, okay, we're, we're all at fault. Our soils that we farm today, by, by comparison's sake, are all relatively young soils. And we haven't been farming them for a lot of years. So in a lot of cases, we've been, we've been living off of the inherent soil organic matter that, the, that we've been blessed to have. But that's quickly eroding. So in case you think I'm phobic, <laughs> mushrooms live there too, or grow there too. And thank you very much. So I guess